Well, going ahead with this afternoon, I would like to now invite on stage Dr. Lakshmi Kant Bajpai, Member of Parliament, National Vice President, BJP India, to please kindly join us on stage. Uh, to accompany him, I would like to invite Regional Chairman Ashok Seth to please join him. And uh, now I would like to invite Vipul Shah, Chairman GJEPC, to please come up on stage to felicitate Dr. Lakshmi Kant Bajpai, Member of Parliament, National Vice President, BJP India. Let's have a huge round of applause as we welcome Dr. Lakshmi Kant Bajpai on stage. Well, now, I would like to request Dr. Lakshmi Kant Pajpai, Member of Parliament, Vice President, BJP India, to please come up on dais and say a few words. Adhanesh Bipul Shahji, Eastern Region ke Chairman Sid Saab, Northern Region, ke, sorry. Is, uh, विचार गोष्ठी में उपस्थित स्वर्ण व्यवसाय से संबंधित सभी वरिष्ठ व्यापारी बंधुओं और बहनों मैं जब दूसरी बार विधायक बना था उत्तर प्रदेश में तब मैंने गोल्ड सिटी के नाम से कार्य योजना उत्तर प्रदेश सरकार में चलवाई थी पर पर तब भी यही था कि एक वर्ल्ड सिटी हो सिंगल गेट हो सुरक्षा की पूरी व्यवस्था हो गोल्ड बैंक भी और अदर बैंक भी और इसकी अनुमति देने वाले सारे विभागीय अधिकारियों के दफ्तर भी उसी के भीतर हों दुर्भाग्य से जमीन पर उतरने से पहले ही अपरिहार्य कठिनाइयों के कारण वो रह गई थी अब भी मेरे क्योंकि मेरठ एशिया में हाथ से बने हुए जेवरों का नंबर एक स्थान है मेरे इस प्रयास के पीछे यही भावना थी कि यहाँ का व्यवसाय ये बढ़े रोजगार बढ़े अब भी मेरे द्वारा इस संबंध में प्रयास किया गया और मैं दुग्गल साहब से आदरणीय शेठ साहब से सबसे बराबर मिला और मेरे यहाँ के व्यापारी भाइयों ने मुझसे बातचीत की मेरठ ज्वेलरी पार्क की स्थापना की तरफ काफ़ी आगे बढ़ गया है इसकी जो बेसिक रिक्वायरमेंट थी कंपनी का रजिस्ट्रेशन होना वो हो गया है अड़तालीस हजार मीटर का एक प्लाट आरक्षित हो गया है मेरठ विकास प्राधिकरण के द्वारा और बहुत शीघ्र उसका पैसा जमा करने के बाद वो इनका होगा मैंने ये भी सवाल उठाया था कि वन डिस्ट्रिक्ट वन प्रोडक्ट बहुत लंबे समय पहले किया गया था अब आवश्यकता है कि वन डिस्ट्रिक्ट टू प्रोडक्ट थ्री प्रोडक्ट करना चाहिए उस जनपद के जो उत्पाद हों उनको लेना चाहिए मेरठ के लिए मैंने गोल्ड का प्रस्ताव दिया है कि गोल्ड के जेवरों का को वन डिस्ट्रिक्ट टू प्रोडक्ट में लो उत्तराखंड ने लिया भी है लेकिन जो कुछ दो तीन समस्याएं आपके यहाँ की हैं उसको मैंने राज्यसभा में उठाया भी है और अभी भी इस बार के सत्र के लिए मैंने प्रश्न डाला अगर आप आया तो और माननीय वित्त मंत्री जी को मैंने पत्र लिखा था एक तो आपके जी वाले प्रकरण पर विचार होना चाहिए जी ज्यादा है दूसरे गोल्ड पर आयात शुल्क घटना चाहिए बिना उसके व्यापार नहीं चलना और एक तरफ हम कहते हैं कि नंबर एक में व्यापार आना चाहिए आदरणीय मोदी जी बराबर इस बात का प्रयास कर रहे हैं लेकिन जितना ज्यादा टैक्स होता है उतना ही बेमानी की तरफ व्यापार बढ़ता है ये एक सर्व स्वीकार्य सिद्धांत है और आज से नहीं पहले से भी ये बात मानी जाती रही थी लेकिन करने को कोई तैयार नहीं होता आज आपका आयात शुल्क अगर 15 प्रतिशत से घटा के पांच परसेंट कर दिया जाए तो चोरी से सोना आना बंद हो जाएगा चोरी से आना सोना बिल्कुल बंद हो जाएगा और जब चोरी से आना सोना बंद हो जाएगा तो निश्चित तौर पर आप लोगों को भी बेईमानी करने की कोई जरूरत नहीं आप ईमानदारी से काम करेंगे सरकार को कर देंगे और कर देने के बाद अच्छे से अच्छा काम करेंगे लेकिन मेरठ में तीस से ऊपर हाथ के 
जेवर बनाने वाले कारीगर हैं मैंने उसको प्रधानता से काम किया था और मुझे इस बात का फक्र है कि आपके नॉर्दर्न रीजन के सेठ साहब और दुग्गल साहब मेरठ तक गए उन्होंने वहाँ सब व्यापारी भाइयों के साथ बैठकर बात करी और बात करने के बाद हमको दिशा दी उस दिशा पर हम आगे बढ़ें लेकिन मैं आज इस अवसर का उपयोग करते हुए आदरणीय शाह जी से मैं आग्रह करना चाहता हूँ कि मेरठ में फ्लैट फ्लैटेड फैक्ट्री कॉम्प्लेक्स या वर्ल्ड सिटी जैसा जो हमारी कल्पना है वो बन सके उसमें राष्ट्रीय स्तर से जितना भी सहयोग आवश्यक है वो कृपा करके हमें देने का काम करें गाइडलाइन हमें दे दें सरकार से लड़ने का काम हम कर लेंगे सरकार से लड़ने में कोई कमजोरी मेरे अंदर नहीं है मैंने उन्नीस साल उत्तर प्रदेश में विधायकी की मंत्री रहा हूँ अब राज्यसभा में हूँ लेकिन सरकार से मैं लड़ लूँगा लेकिन लड़ने के लिए जो ताकत है जो तर्कों की ताकत है वो अगर मुझे मुहैया कराएंगे और मदद करेंगे तो बहुत शीघ्र मेरठ में फ्लैटेड फैक्ट्री कॉम्प्लेक्स भी बनेगा और आखिर जो समस्याएं हैं उनकी तरफ मैं काम करूंगा धन्यवाद मैं डॉक्टर लक्ष्मीकांत पाजपाई का एक बार फिर से शुक्रिया अदा करना चाहूंगी थैंक यू सो वेरी मच सर फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस दिस वंडरफुल वंडरफुल आफ्टरनून थैंक यू सर तो चलिए अब आगे बढ़ते हैं एंड नाउ For a very special session, I would like to invite Mr. Sohail Nathani, Managing Director, Managing Partner, Economic Law Practice on Jewelry Industry SOP. Please help me welcome Mr. Sohail Nathani on stage. Thank you, everybody. I stand here before you as a long-serving uh, organization to JGEPC. Uh, the name of the law firm is Economic Laws Practice, and we've been working with you all for over two decades. I'm very grateful to the officers and the teams at JGEPC for giving us this opportunity. One of the things that we have worked on are uh, for you very recently, which has been very well received, is the standard operating procedure for the industry. And we have taken standard sourcing and sale patterns for the industry. We have analyzed five laws, and these are things that will come up every day before you. I would request you to scan that. That is from the JGEPC website, and वहाँ पर ये पूरा manual है, interactive manual है, और आपको जैसे ही use करना हो, जैसे आपका sourcing हो, जैसे आपका supply हो, वो पूरा information एक ही document में आपको available है. And what is very important is that हमने पूरे देश में जाकर whoever the stakeholders are in various states. वहाँ पर हमने बातचीत करके लॉ को अप्लाई किया है केस लॉ को अप्लाई किया है और ये कॉम्प्रीहेंसिव डॉक्यूमेंट है सो वेर एवर यू गो दिस शुड बी द स्टैंडर्ड ऑपरेटिंग प्रोसीजर फॉर द इंडस्ट्री वाइल आई एम वेरी हैप्पी एंड प्राउड दैट वी हैव पुट दिस टुगेदर विथ जे जी पी सी फॉर यल इट इज ऑल्सो ए ऑन गोइंग प्रोसेस सो देर इज अ प्रोसेस वेर वी विल कंटिन्यू टू इंटरक्ट with jgepc we will update this twice a year and in the interregnum if any of you find any aspects that require clarification or that need to be addressed differently i would urge you to please keep in touch with us this is after all a partnership between jgepc and elp so please continue to engage with us through jgepc directly many of you know my colleagues nishant nishant shah supreme kothari neeraj hande they are all here except nishant 
but please uh, stay in touch, help us make this a comprehensive document, help us strengthen this as we go forward. The layout is very simple and very practical and I will end by saying thank you once again to JGEPC, all the office bearers, all the administrative staff, uh, Mr. Ray, his entire team, uh, Mr. Vipul Shah, everybody for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And moving on, moving on ahead, I'm sure you guys were expecting a lunch break. But we are quickly moving on to the next session, which is on independent store and organized retail, a sustainable coexistence. I would like to invite on our panel members. So very first, uh, Mr. Neil Leish. Handikari, Senior Partner and Global Head, Gems and Jewelry Practice, and Apex Head, Fashion and Luxury Practice. All right, Mr. Neelesh is a Senior Partner and a Global Head, Gems and Jewelry Practice, and Apex Head, Fashion and Luxury Practice. Uh, Neelesh is also an expert in gem and jewelry. He possesses significant expertise in the area of market entry and growth strategy. He worked with KPNG before joining AT Kerne, where in 2006 he was authored the GGEPC KPMG Global Gems and Jewelry Industry Study. The next uh, panelist for this panel discussion is Mr. Raghav Rastogi. Mr. Raghav Rastogi is a visionary eighth generation jeweler behind the transformative evolution of Jugal Kishore Jewelers by Rajan Rastogi. Let's have a round of applause for both our panelists, uh, Mr. Neelesh and Mr. Raghav Rastogi. Next up, I would like to invite Mr. Atul Jain from Atul Jewelers. With an illustrious career spanning four decades, Mr. Atul Jain has established Atul Jewelers as a premium retailer store. Atul Jewelers is also famous for its exclusive collection of ancient collective period jewelry from all parts of India and evidently supports native artisans of handmade jewelers with the expertise. Uh, he is uh, also known uh, to won many awards. And his journey has been exceptionally amazing. A Millennium Diamond Award by DTC London and Pearls the Heart Charity Award from French Polynesia and JGEPC Top Student Award to name a few. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Atul Jain from Atul Jewelers. Now Mr. Vargasi Aluka, Managing Director, Joss Aluka's group, born into a family of uh, aspirational leaders from the jewelry business industry. When it comes to upholding the family legacy, Mr. Vargas Aluka believes in building trustworthy and long-standing relationships with people who add value to the business. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Vargas. Well, last but not the least, a very, very important person, of course, the moderator of this session, Mr. Anil Sankhwal, uh, and uh, Ms. Manisha Gupta, editor, commodities and currency, CNBC TV 18, and Mr. Anil Sankhwal, convener, student jeweler committee, JGEPC, to please join us on stage. Would like to tell you more about Mr. Anil. All right, now let us begin the session on independent store and organized retail, a substantial coexistence. We have the moderators here with us, Mr. Anil and Ms. Manisha. Let's begin the session. Over to you now. Let's have a big round of applause once again for all our panelists and the moderators of the session.
Okay. Um, we do know one thing that we, when we talk about uh, standalone and organized retail chains, there's a lot of debate happening right now, and uh, there are reports suggesting that in next couple of years, and when I say couple, it means two. <laughs> in next couple of years, we would be looking at some 3,000 new retail chains coming into the market, and this is because the street believes and the industry believes that we are looking at an immense growth. There is a lot of buying happening, and there are buyers for handcrafted, authentic, locally, uh, you know, uh, uh, experimented pre pieces as well as lightweight and uh, various stuff that millennials are buying nowadays. But let's get the, set the context setting first. And Ilesh, why don't you take over and tell us on what rim numbers, what reports are you working with? I would like to add one more thing, yes. Nilesh. Uh, some years back, I think 10, 12 years ago, he was commissioned to study the jewelry trends in the market. And today's presentation, becomes even more imperative and, impre and interesting to see how much has become true. He will give in detail, but I think uh, it is something uh, which can be a, uh, a benchmark to go in the future. Please look at it very carefully, understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Uh, thank you for the invitation. <clears throat> uh, I consider myself more a friend of uh, the industry than a management consultant who advises the industry. Um, and I think Mr. Sankwal is right. Uh, back in the year 2005, I had actually done a study on the leading family jewelers of that time. Um, and I'd actually gone and met with almost about 30 odd jewelers across the country. <clears throat> and uh, that time, modern, what we call organized retail was kind of just about coming in. Tanishk was still relatively small, so there were a lot of questions and doubts about it. Uh, and we had talked about uh, many things which eventually came true. Uh, uh, the situation is quite different now in 2023 uh, it's quite different and therefore i would even uh, object to the title it's not independent stores and, and organized retail it's not that independent stores are not organized it is independent stores and national or regional chains so it's a difference between us a, a single store and a chain store that's that's a fact it doesn't mean because uh, it's an independent it's not organized the definition of organized retail actually means that when you have standardized uh, practices and so on, then you are called organized. <clears throat> and many of the large jewelers are actually very organized. Uh, so let's, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about what should independents do uh, in the context, what organized uh, retail or large chains do is pretty obvious. So just a little bit of context uh, about the market. Um, uh, There's a fine jewelry market for major countries that you see. India is the third largest. You have China and US which are uh, larger than us. Uh, but in terms of share of say, jewelry sales as a percentage of GDP, India is one of the highest. Uh, it's no, no secret that you know, jewelry runs in our blood. There is tremendous fascination for jewelry in our country. So that's about 1.8% compared to that. China is a pretty large market, largely, and jewelry consumption is a, uh, has a very strong correlation with per capita income. So where the per capita income is high, jewelry consumption is high. And China is also a little bit traditional market uh, like us. Difference between China and US is that, you know, the US is more a diamond jewelry market compared to, uh, let's say, India or China. <clears throat> we've done a projection on how this market will, will move, um, and we've done various kinds of regression on, uh, and people have asked us this question, that uh, when you look at your, the younger generation, they don't seem to be buying as much jewelry as the older generation did. So because of that, does it mean that uh, the jewelry market will not grow as much? Uh, but what we don't realize is that there may be, you and I might be buying less jewelry, uh, today, but there are a lot more people who, as they come out of the middle class, uh, they have more money in their hand. The first thing they go and do is buy jewelry. Uh, and even the people who have graduated, let's say, to the upper classes, what they spent earlier and what they spend now is significantly different. They are spending a lot more. Uh, even in all weddings today, even jewelry still continues to be a 30% of the total spend. So that's not changed. <clears throat> so if you do, do do this modeling about from about four and a half lakh crores, uh, what it is now, it is likely to grow at about 14 odd percent. Uh, per annum uh, and reaching a size of about 11 uh, to 13 lakh crores by 2030. It went through a little bit of a dip uh, during the COVID years, but and before that also it was moving, growing at about 12, 13 percent. So otherwise, it's a reasonably secular trend. Uh, so the industry does not need to worry about growth. <clears throat> Question of uh, you know how does this? What's the split of the market between let's say uh, branded jewelry versus independents? Uh, and we've. Uh, if you look at across the world, uh, in China, this is almost about 40%, uh, almost 44% now. The global average is about 20, 22%. Uh, 
uh, India, uh, it's about 35 percent now. Uh, and I was talking to you, you can see here in 2005 when I had done the, done the sizing, it was almost only about 3 percent. So from 3 percent to, you know, 35 percent in, it's moved very, very fast. It is actually the rate of organization in this industry has gone much faster than in the case of other lifestyle industries like apparel. And it's expected to grow to about 40 percent. Um, uh, just some com quick comparison on, we tried to do, do some financial comparison on, you know, uh, between national or regional chains versus uh, independents. What's the difference? Is there some difference? There are some differences, okay? And uh, uh, this is what the numbers say. Numbers in this industry are not easy to get, okay, because uh, the number of people reporting is not all that, all that high. So it's a little difficult for us to get numbers of independent jewelers. But typically what we have seen is that the chains tend to have a higher gross margin percentage compared to the independents. A uh, lot of it is uh, because of two reasons. Number one, the percentage of uh, diamond jewelry that they sell is much higher. And second, they also mark up their prices a little bit more. So they charge more making charges on diamonds, they charge higher, uh, etc. cetera. <clears throat> uh, independents tend, tend to have more gold. Of course, there are enough independents who do largely diamonds as well. But uh, they are more conservative in their pricing. Uh, similarly, when it comes to the EBITDA margins, uh, you'll find that the chains are actually making uh, decent margins. Uh, independents tend to make lower margins. They tend to think more in terms of, uh, you know, asset turns. Uh, advertising and promotion spends, again, you find the chains spend a lot more. Actually, globally, chains spend almost about 10 percent of their turnover on, on marketing here. It's still much lower uh, in India. Independents spend very less. And there was actually a time back in 2005, people used to measure that uh, spend on uh, advertising and promotion as a percentage of profit, not as a percentage of turnover. Here we're talking about percentage of turnover. So we've come a long way. Uh, and finally, in terms of inventory turnover ratio also, uh, see the chains seem to be turning their uh, assets much faster. Now, there's a little bit of difference in this. Uh, I know when we had in, interviewed many independents, they tend to think of the inventory in their stores as their net worth. So their target is that if today I have, you know, my father, when he left the store, I had 500, you know, kilograms of gold uh, in my store. Uh, and when I leave the store for my son, it should be 1,000 kilograms of gold in the store. So they tend to think of the store as their net worth, not as... Uh, inventory, whereas uh, if, you, if you think of lifestyle retail, inventory actually is considered bad. You know, you need inventory because you need to sell something, but having more inventory does not increase your sales. Uh, so <clears throat> that is a slight difference in mindset that people have, and inventory also comes at a cost. So, and in, in this business, inventory is the most expensive uh, uh, thing on your P&L. So the cost of the inventory is high. <clears throat> Um, in terms of behaviors, the jewelry buying behaviors are still traditional and they are influenced by parents. Uh, and if you look at uh, how there's a gradual shift that is happening from to modernity over generations. So over generations, there is a shift. So my mother probably would be a little bit more modern in her thinking compared to her mother. And my wife is likely to be you know, more modern uh, compared to my mother. And my daughter will perhaps be even more modern in her thinking. Uh, and if you look at the way this evolution happens, the teenage, uh, uh, I mean, it is, we're not talking about men's jewelry. Uh, because predominantly it is still a women's uh, business. The teenage uh, daughters, they have limited affiliation towards gold. They think design is most in terms of, you know, uh, flowers, animals and so on. They don't understand purity, quality. Uh, and it's essentially the jewelry that they buy is parents buy, they buy them little bit, small bits and pieces. It's when they are the bride to be is when they really start thinking about jewelry. And even at that time, the jewelry choices are influenced a lot by family uh, and media, but they, they are part of that. It is, uh, but when the it becomes a married woman, their choices uh, change a little bit. They start to think a little bit about jewelry as investment also. And of course, they wear a lot more jewelry, part of it almost as their daily wear. Uh, their buying behavior is that they are accompanied by someone, it tends to be the, the husband when otherwise. Uh, and the mother or the bride or the mother-in-law, they are the, typically the gatekeepers of the tradition and they would typically decide what is bought in a wedding. Uh, and it's the, the daughter-in-law, the daughter who kind of influenced them towards more modern uh, purchases. They also tend to be the decision makers. When, when jewelry is given as a gift, the senior members in the family decide a lot more. Uh, maybe if a phone has to be given as a gift, maybe the younger people will decide. But if jewelry has to be given a gift, elders would decide. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if you study the market, you know, I've tried to simplify this. Uh, you know, what, what are the kind of consumer segments that exist in the market? So. There is a modern consumer and there's a traditional consumer. Uh, and there's also what is called as an, an emergence of an extravagant consumer or a consumer who wants to show off. The traditional consumer bought jewelry because that was part of their tradition. Um, <clears throat> more gold. Um, uh, the modern consumer was the one that all modern jewelry chains started to, to think about. And they, the archetype was the working woman. Um, 
where they decide on their own. The traditional jewelry is bought by, by parents, uh, others involvement. There's a largely even an investment angle in that. In the, the modern consumer, there's no investment angle. Uh, but there's also the emergence of the extravagant consumer. People are buying jewelry as a status symbol, as a matter of their showing off their wealth. Uh, and they want jewelry that really stands out and shows their wealth. It's, it's the same luxury consumer who wants to carry a bag with a logo. It's the same behavior reflected in jewelry. Um, if you just look at the way uh, chains and uh, independents advertise themselves, uh, the chains traditionally started off by focusing on the modern consumer, and all of them realized that the big market actually is the wedding market, the bridal jewelry market, the traditional market is the larger market. So all of them have tried to move towards that market to get a share of that. Um, and towards that, they are trying to you know, create occasions where you know, they showcase brides, they show uh, uh, occasions. Uh, they are also playing on emotions of various types. Uh, you know, modern values, uh, inclusivity, they are trying to play on various themes to uh, uh, do that. Um, independent, they don't advertise that many, that much, so it's not, easy, not wasn't easy to get too many examples of uh, uh, advertisements from uh, independents. But uh, it's, I think they are also focusing on, uh, of course they focus on the brides for sure, uh, because that's their core segment uh, traditionally. But they are also trying to, uh, you know, focus more on diamonds, focus more on the uh, opulent consumer, the consumer is trying to show off, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily only on the traditional kind of consumer. Um, so finally, if you look at, you know, what could independent jewelers do? I mean, there are a few suggestions that uh, that we have. Um, there are a set of hygiene factors, and they have, they have emerged in some of the discussions uh, that have gone uh, so far. So think of them as hygiene factors and differentiators. What are the hygiene factors? Uh, there was a time, uh, you know, 20 years ago, when when you bought a piece of jewelry, you were not sure. Uh, what was the carriage that you got, okay? Those days have long gone uh, because of enough carat meters in every store, uh, hallmarking and so on. Now that doubt is, is, is much less uh, compared to what it was earlier. Um, <clears throat> so I guess one of the basic things to do is to make sure that as an independent, if you're selling something, sell, promise what you are, deliver what you're promising. Uh, let there be no disconnect between what you're promising and what you're delivering, okay? Uh, so to that extent, transparent and consistent pricing policies are useful. And I'm not suggesting that you should give the last breakup, you know, there's, there's no need to give a breakup of your jewelry if you don't feel like it. There are, brands don't necessarily give a breakup of it. So I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying make your policy and stick to it. Uh, if you want to uh, give the breakup of the gold, please give. If you want to give the breakup of the diamonds, please give. Uh, but make sure it is, it is consistent. Make a policy and stick to it. You'll find all kinds of people in the market. You'll find people who give total diamond weight. You'll find people who will give the you know weight of the large stone separately and the small stone separately, but they will not give the quality of the two separately. So there are as many variations, and there of course there are brands which will not give anything. They'll just do like an MRP. But make your point and stick to it. Uh, okay, uh, you'll lose a customer any which way. Don't think that by giving more you'll hold hold on to the customer. Customer will stay if they want. They will go if they they don't like it. Um, Acceptance of digital payment uh, certificates, uh, because this is a high value purchase, consumers want confidence, do everything that you can to boost their confidence. So that's one of the hygiene factors. Second, digital marketing. Uh, the modern consumer and increasingly most consumers now, think of your digital presence as a sign of authenticity. If you don't have a website, they think you don't exist. I'm sure uh, all of you know the younger generation, uh, even if they want a watermelon, they'll first go and check on the internet, okay? They want jewelry, they'll check on the internet. Anything for them, if it doesn't exist on the internet, it doesn't exist. So uh, your consumers will have that, that, they'll come with a little bit of that. So make sure you have a good digital presence and it's not that expensive. So even doing things using use iPad technologies in your stores, marketing yourself, making sure a lot of inventory is on the website, uh, do that. It's a myth if you believe that your designs are so exclusive that somebody, you'll put it out on the net and somebody will copy it. Just go and check what designs are available on the net, okay? There is more, uh, more than, an, enough which is available there. There is nothing left to copy, okay? So don't be afraid of that. Um, <clears throat> um, I would say, and, and do partner with people, uh, micro influ influencers and celebrities uh, to do that. Uh, so it's not an option, digital marketing is not an option anymore. Finally, in terms of differentiators, retain your core customer. As, a, as an independent, independents have a very, very strong hold on the customers in their area. They know the customs, they know the uh, practices, you know, the, what the mama has given to the bungee and what the, you know, X and has to give to Y in a particular wedding and you know, 
they know exactly that, which a chain will never know, they don't even bother, okay? That's your core consumer. Focus on that, try not to lose them. People who have bought from you from generations, make sure their children are buying from you. Uh, if they bought from you 100%, make sure at least they're buying 80% from you, you know, going forward. So hold on to them. Uh, and to that extent, whatever you need to do on your product portfolio and so on need to be done. Personalization and customization, that's your big, big strength. Change dwellers will not customize, you can customize. Make that, make that your USP and do it quickly. Uh, that will help customers come back to you. It's like the, uh, you know, there's a made to measure, uh, there's a ready-made suit and then there's a made to order, right? And the, when it comes to apparel, the, the made to order or the customized suit actually costs the most. You will pay a premium. Um, <clears throat> and then of course there are enough services that you can do, complimentary polishing, cleaning, uh, gold schemes, flexible credit options, these are all things may make it easy, easy for customers. Also, I mean look at, think about discounts and so on. Uh, I used to always hear that uh, independent, either they say they don't discount or you'll get a variable discount. But look at chains, they give discounts, you know, they'll do a monsoon festival, Diwali festival, they, they'll give a flat discount option. It's not that, there's nothing against discounts, discounts stimulate demand, there's no problem. The question is, if the discounts are not transparent or if I go and I haggle with you a lot and you give me a little bit more and somebody else comes and they haggle less and you give them less, then there's always a doubt, should I have haggled more, okay? So therefore, you are always a loser. So the best thing to do is to, if you are giving a discount, have a standard policy and it should not differ whether I'm talking to the store manager or I'm talking to the owner, okay? It you should, uh, like if you go to a chain, there is nobody else, you only see the store manager, you never see the owner. So. If you have a discount policy, by all means, but make it transparent and straightforward and simple. And finally, innovation. There's a lot of insights that you can get from the data that you already have about your consumers. You know so much, nobody else knows that. Uh, see how you can leverage that uh, to do it. And then uh, uh, leverage the modern innovations that are happening. There's silver jewelry, there's lab-grown diamonds. There's no need to be afraid of any of those. People ask me this question, what happened to lab-grown diamonds? Uh, if you go to a Dama store in, in uh, the Middle East, you'll see they sell diamond jewelry in one, uh, you know, this one, right next to it is the lab-grown diamonds. And they say people can come and compare and they can buy what they want. They say we make money on both, so it doesn't matter. So eventually the, that's where the world will, world will get to. So don't be afraid of any of these things. Whatever new is coming, please offer it to your consumers. So uh, thank you very much. That's all I had to say and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Nandesh. I think uh, you've covered uh, quite well the, the full aspects of this session. But I think we'll today we will divide into two parts. Sustainability of a retail chain, a retail independent store vis-a-vis -vis a, a chain. So your study was, uh, I, I distinctly remember, you had mentioned about small fish, big fish. Second part was that uh, eventually in 10 years time to come, perhaps only niche jewelers, independent jewelers will remain. The rest will be consumed by the retail chain. That was some, some talk about that. So today I think as a first part, we'll take up uh, is, uh, uh, your views on that, plus we have retailers and the chain stores over here, but they will also give their views. Now second will be your compliance. Now compliance has been taken in many ways. One is a mandatory, which is by the government. One is self-regulated. So that we'll take up in the second part of it. Please, Nish, can you go ahead and then we can discuss it. So I spoke a lot, so I'd like to, it'll be better if the rest of the panelists give their opinions more. Um, but as you see, the share of organized uh, retailers, all chains are, is, um, the maximum is in China, about 44%, otherwise it's 20, 22%. So there are independents in all countries, even in the large markets, there are independents. So independents will continue to exist. Um, one of the things I had found in earlier studies was that uh, many of the smaller independents are actually not jewelers, they're effectively money lenders, okay, because 70, 80 percent of their income actually comes from money lending. Only 20, 30 percent comes from actually selling jewelry. Now, for money lending, there are enough other options. Okay, uh, but buying jewelry, there are not enough options. So, uh, if if you are largely a money lender, then you will face competition from banks and a whole host of other agencies. Um, so that that business will get challenged from those. But as an independent jeweler, you definitely have your own own niche, uh, and there's an area that you really know well so that nobody can take away from you and the chains will not even try to do that because it is too specific uh, for them. They try to prefer a product which will sell all across. So there is uh, a happy coexistence is, is not just possible, it is evident. So it will happen. Your second question was on compliance. Yes. Yeah. 
we have with us Mr. Atul Jain, who is a, a retailer and uh, he sells ethnic jewelry plus traditional jewelry plus the modern jewelry. I would like to ask him, how does he feel challenged in selling this jewelry which are with the retail, uh, the chain stores? Or uh, how do you think he, he overcomes that? Please. Uh, thank you, Anilji. Friends, I would uh, recall the times when I took over the business from my father a cool 30 years back. And most of you can recall how the businesses were run at that time. The first thing I tried to introduce into my store is a tag, the price. It has to be as transparent, as fixed as possible. So that was the first thing. And then slowly and gradually as years passed by, we started putting up the qualities of diamonds, we started mentioning the gold purity, and we started the, the process of uh, in-house grading and certification. And I remember the time when uh, I was in the process of setting up a lab in 2004 into Delhi, a gentleman uh, came up to me and said, Atul, what are you doing? The hira is from our word. What is, what will certificate do with it? It's from the young age. I said, sir, you are here, I'm here, we'll talk five years ahead. Later, we'll talk five years later. And five years later, the same gentleman, when I spoke to him, he said, you were right. Now, paper is selling, the certification is selling. So see how things have changed. And these adaptations have been adapted faster by these uh, so-called very organized uh, chain stores. But what, what's wrong if we become organized ourselves? The single store owners, who is stopping them to organize themselves? Who is stopping them to uh, adopt these practices, these practices, and learn about these uh, transparent and fair business practices? And there is a silver lining with us that we have the advantage of transforming ourselves in line of our client. We have the advantage of knowing our client and their family history for last 50 years. We have so many more advantages. The owners are directly in touch with the clients. When we are selling jewelry, product involves only 50% of it. The rest of the 50% is a part of your client relations a part of how you deliver, the part of how you make them happy. The, these are the things. So we can, we have all those advantages. Single store owners, I think, are more advantageous, in a more advantageous position than the threat from these multi-store uh, multi retailers. Now, just as the presentation you saw, that, that we saw that a graph that soon these multi-store retailers would be reaching 40% of the entire business. But I would say another thing, that what I am experiencing, that they are helping us gain those clients who are the first time buyers. Where does the first time buyer go? He would probably go to a Tanishka store. He would probably go to a Kalyan store because they feel more safe there. But then they are the first time buyers. Let them buy once, twice, thrice. Then they would, then the probabilities open up and they would explore more. So that is where they are giving us a tap into the huge potential of buyers. He just said that a, a huge middle class is waiting to transform into a, a very affluent class in India and who better than Indian economy who will be going to see that in the next 15 years. So I think there is a huge potential for the single store owners. The only need of the R is to transform ourselves, adapt ourselves, adapt technology. Thank you. I put, I'll put a similar question to you as well, Raghav, and I have, uh, you know, when it comes to single store owners, as, as very well put, Atul, that the first buyers perhaps will get into a Kalyan or a, or a Tanishka or a Malabar, and then, yes, you want something more special, you want uh, it customized, you want that cons customer, uh, you know, attention, and you want that service, and that is when perhaps uh, the single chain owners, a uh, single chain, uh, rather the single store uh, people come in. You know, I have to tell you this, Raghav, there are, there's a lot of time that, uh, I've seen Tanya wear something, and I've asked her, is this something that you can create for somebody else as well? So this is exactly where designs come in. This is where the, uh, you know, the, the consumer interest comes in. What would you say when it comes to a single store? What, what are the experiences? How would you look at the customer service there? How would you look at evolving? And how are you looking at competing with the retail stores? See, a lot of time what happens is that retail chains, they have lesser agility than what we have. We can practically overnight change our categories and you know offer something different to the customer the next day. 
but that is that agility is not there with the retail chains and with large store owners of uh, independent store owners as mr uh, atul said that uh, this personal relation plays a very important role and as uh, mr nilesh also pointed out that mama ne bhanji ko kya diya ye bhi jo hai na usko jo hai na wo pata hai so these sort of insights help you a lot and then you know, catering to a specific market because of this instagram and pinterest the designs have become international brides or people who are buying jewelry are coming they have uh, pre researched at what kind of looks they want and with this the new manufacturing of cad and lightweight jewelry so it is easier for the family jewelers also to have those products which are there with the chains and then comes that pricing part because i believe that india the middle indian middle class is always very price sensitive and when they compare and when they see these host of other practices which you know you get the like sort of like you know someone who has gifted the product comes after 10 days wants to exchange like if he walks into a chain store then he's given some reasons that uh, this will be deducted or this will be deducted but that small 1000 rupee or 500 rupee benefit which you give to the client you gain that client for a lifetime and someone who's buying let's say 50000 product right now maybe he needs to gift his wife something but when his sister's wedding is there then you know his preference is that unhone mera fayda kiya tha to let's go there so i think that idea really plays very well for family stores and they understand it very well especially legacy jewelers because it is instilled that you know like you are because of this brand this brand is not because of you and when you take care of your clients needs and that turnaround time is faster like for example one particular client she had to fly to seattle for her wedding she came very late had some medical issues she wanted an engagement ring and her time period was one and a half days she wanted a full solitaire ring with an entire eternity band and everything she came to like she went to so many stores someone suggested that you know like why don't you go and talk to him and we delivered it and from that point we get orders from her friends in seattle and they come to lucknow they come specially to lucknow to buy jewelry from us something like this i think this is our leverage point and as mr nilesh said that independents are not going away market is growing our business share is growing our businesses are growing and because more and more people are buying jewelry so naturally we will see growth in all the faces in chains and as well as independents oh absolutely raghav you put it very well uh, yes you know if uh, the retail stores uh, spend way more in sense of advertising what works for you guys is word of mouth which is very very strong just one more question if you have 10 loyal customers like that is it always uh, are you always able to retain them or uh, uh, is there a time when because there is a better offer coming in from um, alukas uh, you lose them to that see what i have felt like since i have joined the business i see the customers are very flirtatious now they are going to explore their options and something as loyal as a customer when we talk about i think the loyalty is generated by the quality which you offer and not by the designs people what from what i see that if someone is having a wedding in their family so if they are buying 15 products three will be from me four will be from some other jeweler two will be some other jeweler they don't want to have that you know like one specific designs so they explore and the thing is that you know when more people join this fray so our turnovers they increase and as far as people are concerned that you know if you are finding a better offer somewhere then naturally you will go there but as again like mr atul pointed out that you know like the first time buyers they go to like bigger brands because of a sense of security but once they see that you know the pre, like because of these practices like uh, huids and certifications and everything now independent stores are also at par with what you know like the perceived value was that chain stores offer better transparency and better value that is helping and that's why you see a lot of independent stores are transforming into regional and national chains one uh, I'd like to add to what she mentioned with more and more uh, chain stores coming into high end jewelry now how challenged do you feel because primarily uh, as atul pointed out the first time buyers are not necessarily buy for high end jewelry they want some regular uh, tea party jewelry or whatever now th when, when the chain stores are coming into very high end jewelry now what will matter the trust factor the family jeweler the re the, the, ch the the stores they know can you expand on that please i mean it's a mix of both when people are buying high jewelry so they are very well researched they know what kind of gold is going into this what kind of emeralds or pole keys or diamonds are going into this there i feel the design prima facie the design matters the most because the bride there is not looking that piece of jewelry in terms of price 
but how it's going to, you know, like her whole ensemble is going to look like on that particular day. Because peop like people who are going to for higher end jewelry, at times they spend more on the photographer than they are spending on the jewelry. So the entire look plays a very important role. And second is the pricing. So from, the, from what I've heard, like we, have, we do all our research like with our fellow competitors, the prices at which these products are offered, so there is a very steep difference. And retailers are, are able to offer a host of services, like you know, I said like in your uh, portfolio, uh, like in your presentation, the credit facilities. So credit facility is something which a retailer, like an independent retailer can offer to an old client, but I don't think so a chain is going to offer credit to, you know, like a first time buyer. That also plays a very big difference in retaining those customers. Point taken. Varghese, uh, we know you have a flight to catch. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because uh, Burgis has a flight to catch and we know we, we have to come to it. And you know, the point being that you started with one store and now you are a multi-store. So you do want to share your experience on how was business with you when you, were, when you started with that one store and how has the growth been? Okay, uh, uh, we are into a family business which was started in 1964. And um, I've been into this uh, retail industry for last 30 years. So I've seen the transformation from the single store to the... Uh, organized what we are from two stores uh, now we are on a, almost around 52 stores so the first thing I have to uh, the family members uh, need to take a call whether they want to expand or they want to go all over the south or where, whatever so when you are a single store or a independent store you you know your customer well they come to you you can give them whatever the offer they want they want or the whatever the design they prefer but after that, when you want to have more number of store, you have to have a, a team or, or a organization uh, which is well uh, organized, like the way we make purchases from the vendors, the way we, make, uh, we do the marketing. So these, there are a lot of changes. So I have seen the transformation, like in those days, uh, in 94, 30 years back, I used to be in the jewelry once uh, during my college days. So in those days, we, uh, as mentioned, we used to tally the stock. We used to be a, a cashier. We used to be the uh, logistics we deal with. We do the marketing and all that work to cater the small crowd or the community whom you know. Then later on, when the competition comes, like slowly you move into another state. Like we first started in Kerala, then we have moved on to Tamil Nadu, then Karnataka, Andhra, Telangana, Ladakh. So it is. Uh, the family should, uh, whether they should first take a call to understand how you want to do the business, how you want to expand. So you have to get organized. Like earlier days, when you have four or five store, it was ma easy to manage. What you sell in 50 stores today, you may be selling it in four or five stores. So quantity has uh, come uh, so different. Like in those days, it was only 300 rupees per gram, if, I, um, if I'm correct, in 94. Now it's almost 5,000. So uh, till there are people buying, keep buying in South because uh, not only the wedding season, other than when the gold price appreciate, all, all people like when they have money with them, they are always buying. So we basically are a retailers or we can call it as a resellers. We get the best product available from the vendors or the manufacturers, Pan India, because uh, when you come into an uh, organized way, you have a team dedicated to do the purchases. You have a de dedicated team to understand the customer's needs, then do the marketing and uh, uh, do the training. You know, each location has different types of ornaments, different way of dealing with the customers. So these all changes are happening uh, in organized when you are able to run a lot of stores. When you are with a single store, you can manage with them, provide, but when you are in a single store, you are having a limitation on the designing or marketing cost or finance. When you are expanding, you can have a lot of design, pan in there, you can collect. You can do more marketing uh, on uh, products. Now we are, uh, after gold, we have been associated with uh, platinum jewelry, uh, and then DBS, which sells us the uh, for, for our diamonds. Then we also have uh, support from MMTC PAM, who does all of our scrap gold recycling to into new products. So this is a chain, you need a proper uh, planning and proper uh, organized way to expand. Once you are uh, organized, it is easier to expand. Now you can see the 
southern state like Kerala has, I think, 10, 12 uh, corporates, like, especially from Thrissur, where we are. Um, we are there, Alupas, Joe's, Joy, it's a group which has been separated in 2001. So we are uh, Joe's Alukas and Uncle, he's Joy Alukas. So these two groups are in Kerala, then Bhima, Josko. Uh, then uh, if you look into South, there are a lot of players who are running more than 50 stores. They are well organized. They know what all things required for their customers. They do the marketing in such a way that they try to get more and more customers. So. Uh, doing a family business, it is, they have their scope, there are customers for that. Even we in a smaller towns in Tutair cannot compete with the uh, uh, independent store where they have a lot of bigger stock. The uh, owner is directly dealing with them, they are flexible on payments, uh, there are a lot of things can be done. But when you come into uh, organized, you have a pricing, you have a minimum uh, discount uh, or you have uh, certain things which cannot go down like how the owners can be done. So there are a lot of changes, but both can survive. Like, uh, because retailers who are planning to expand, they will keep expanding, but their volume somehow cannot be same as a local competitor. But local uh, grown jewelers are also doing well. So this is how the uh, transformation has been done. Can I put this in a question, Atulji? Sure, sure. Okay. So, uh, as Raghav says, he knows most of his customers. As Varghese, Mr. Varghese says, yeah, that is something that you lose in touch with. So, if you were to grow, uh, or are you happy being this? Or do you think, you know, what we are seeing right now is that a lot of um, single stores are moving into expansions or getting in from one store to two stores. People are moving in from one state to other states as well. There is growth that we've see, we're seeing at various levels. How do you see yourself? Well, uh, I would go back a little bit. Four years ago, we had a session with Mr. Shivram. He's a known uh, a jewelry guru. He, he trains jewelers on to getting into organized. So the first line that he said after meeting a group of 10 jewelers has said, without, do you know your inventory? And do you know your stock turnover? And without even asking your answer, I can tell you that you are sitting on at least four times the inventory required to run your store. You can run four stores with the same inventory. And he was right. When at the end of the day, when we analyzed the entire data that he uh, made us spill out, we could see that. So actually, what is stopping us to grow? There is no stopping. We just need to organize. We just need to put into s those systems into place. And the biggest is the mind block that how will I manage two store? I can't handle my one store. So the day you get off your store and it is being managed, that day you can manage two also. So it is just a matter of being organized. And coming back to this, apart from this question, I, Anilji, I would like to answer the question which you asked just before that, that with these, uh, the retail chains getting into high value inventory. So I have a very interesting, uh, thing to share here. There was a wedding in my friend's family and I were to buy dresses for three different occasions. So there was a jag run happening and as such I went into Manyavar finally because the days were left. So I went into Manyavar, bought a 20,000 rupees kurta pajama set and I wore that on that day of jag run. And imagine what happened. Three more people were wearing the same that day on, I dread to wear that <laughs> to, to any function. So you see, with these large chain stores dealing into high value, we know our high value clients and I ask them the same question. Would you be crossing a, same, a client wearing the same set <laughs> that you are wearing in a, in a, in a function wear? <laughs> so that is the answer to this. This is, this is the advantage that a single store owner has it. Atul, thank you very much for sharing your uh, experience and insight. And I think you have, you have touched it very well, that why single store, that uh, for, for high end, why single store? Which also brings one more question to mind. I think before we go into luxury part, I'll let, because he has to go, so I'll ask him. Uh, the compliance issue. So we have been talking about responsible sourcing, responses, re responsible compliances, but they're all geared towards government. Are we going to say something about our compliances toward the customer, our own clients, which are our, our bread and butter? They are our God. And we don't even talk about that. 
what is our responsibility to report and to tell our clients. So I think, uh, Mr. Varghese, let me ask you because I think you have to go. What do you feel that should be mandatory? Forget the goal, uh, the goal or marking, it has become mandatory now, so there's not an issue. What should be mandatory on part of a jeweler to tell and, 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 and be transparent about to the clients? How, how, how important it is for you? Yes, please. Compliance means reporting to the, uh, telling your clients the actual story. That, that's the compliance I'm talking about. See, the government compliances are already taken care of. You have to do it, it's mandatory. I mean, nobody's asking you to do it, it's been done by the government. BIS has taken care of all marking. I'm asking your responsibility to talk about the quality of diamonds, the treatments, how, it's see, regarding the many more things on okay. that. See, we are the first jewelers, maybe in India, to start with 916 quality of gold, which was far in 2001. Now, uh, last two years or three years back, it has been mandatory to sell uh, HUID gold. So that is one thing. Another thing what we have done with the quality and buyback is that we sell one of the certified VBS EFS quality diamonds, which we give 100% exchange or cashback offers. And even the gold jewelry what we sell, uh, are the, the one which can be exchanged, the one which can be sold for cash. So this transparency is very clear. Like uh, now, you can see in a lot of advertisement, there are ten promises being given to the jewelers, to the customers. Like so, the customer, uh, you know, when they come and buy jewelry, they have to be very much confident that they are getting the best quality product for what they are paying for. So we have been uh, very much uh, looking into the quality what we sell. We are also very much into the after sales whenever they want to sell it or whenever they want to exchange it. So as you have a brand of around more than 50, 55 stores, people are popular with your brand. Whether they can buy it from this location, go in and exchange it in a different state or cash it in a different way. So these all are very transparent and we are offering all these buyback policies where there is no dispute happening with any customers after selling the product. And even government uh, compliance, there are a lot of uh, regulations have come. Till then, we are losing a lot of customers when we apply all these government regulations. There are a lot of customers who will not be uh, able to cope up with these rules and regulations. So we are missing that way. It, it can be a blessing for the independent store where they, they can be do, do something like that. So we, as a corporate way, we are organized in one way that it cannot be changed to different, different customers. Uh, uh, my, my, uh, my take on that was actually self-disclosure. My issue was something else. Yes, you sell fine quality, you sell uh, certified gold, but there are certain things which are many more things which needs to be disclosed to a client. So uh, how, how well versed you are with this, or how much you are doing, or how much your store managers are uh, capable of doing it, what, what happens there? Like, uh, for example, as we uh, organized, there are a lot of uh, requests from customers, but we always say no to that. Because when you... Uh, uh, to maybe someone want to pay in cash or someone. No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I think I, I, I did not put it rightly. Maybe. Yeah. My, my issue was this: that if you are selling a diamond, which is treated, which is, which has been treated, has been, you know, laser treated or whatever, do you tell your client that this is treated? Do you tell a color stone which is treated, a color stone which is maybe, maybe a doublet for that, or do you tell your client? Are you, or your store managers are capable of understanding and explaining to your client on that way? See, we uh, do certain level of quality check and give the best product. But there is no, uh, these kind of things have happened to us, I think. Whatever we sell, we buy back in the same manner. So we have been uh, uh, given a, as a barcode and certified way, whatever is being sell, uh, sold with the same papers, we can. But these things have not come to us in the, such a way. I think we should put the same question to Raghav now. I think that's important to compare and yes. see what happens. Uh, when you, when, you, when you talk to your clients and it is very important as you said that you know uh, if the color stone is treated or not if it's a doublet or not a lot of times there are jewelries which can be worn on a regular basis and cannot be worn on a regular basis issues like this have to be guided to a customer just like a manual when we buy a mobile or a car or something we are given a demo or something of, of that sort so this is what we do like we personally so uh, when we sell, we have we categorically tell people that you know we do not sell uh, any treated uh, color stones. 
and the certificates which we are give we press on the issue that you know this is a natural uh, sapphire which is no heat treatment or no color treatment issues like this are pointed out and that also transforms into better sales because you know higher value products for higher value products customers have more faith that okay uh, let's say at jugal kishore you don't get a heat treated sapphire then there are also issues that you know with this new designs with these lightweight rings and chains and everything the issues of breaking have you know like they are very common which my father used uh, did not used to face so a lot of designs in our uh, personal preference which you know we have got bad uh, response from we tell our customers beforehand that you know if you are buying something like this this is not for regular wear this is a slightly delicate product and then you explain it in such a way like an example between a silk or a cotton is given to the customer that you know these are two separate products and needs to be used separately that adds to the trust value and that also adds to the per, like increase in the ticket size of the customer that customer if you know is buying let's say a 2000 rupee product will also be enticed to buy another 50000 rupee product only when you are explaining these policies and as mr vargi said that color clarity of a diamond should be categorically mentioned on the bill or the certificate which is given to the client there should not be any ambiguity because practices like these are very prevalent in north like in south ef vvs is a very common norm but like in north like i can say with like you know absolute certainty like in the state or like in the city of lucknow we have been the only jeweler who have been selling ef vvs for last 35 years at that point my father used to hear words like bhai aap to dakati dal rahe itna mehanga kahan hota hai ira and now those same customers are coming back ki ab 30 saal se anguthi pehn rahe iski chamak nahi kam hui so that loyalty factor really snowballs into something big and this disclosure on the first instance makes like you know the, those trust factor like how tanish became a tanish it's not just because it's a tata it's also because of the practices they are following so those same like we should learn from it and there's no harm in learning from someone who's leading the industry because in the end if the industry is growing the customer's faith like as long as it's a diamond customer he's a potential customer for me but if he you know like has a bad experience with diamond then for that for that customer the entire jewelry industry is blacklisted so it is important that that is kept in mind and i request all my fellow jewelers also to practice the same uh, uh, supplement to this aga i was not uh, more apprehensive about what quality you are selling it's individual store to store i can decide to sell the finest or the lowest my only thing was that we have to report correctly to the client we have to we have a right certificates process like you have lab grown diamonds there are lot of, lot of home grown labs so you can give a certificate from a home grown lab of a home home owned labs how will it that help i think that should be also understood and 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 should be referred to and as as a retailer across the country we should have some standard my whole issue was that should we it be mandatory or should be reg self regulated i would like to add something to this so there's this practice which we follow at our store so there's this cvd machine and a carotometer which is out there in the public and whenever we buy we sell diamonds we make it a point that you know like we are giving certificates like from igi or sgl whatever lab but at that very point when the customer is purchasing the goods they are made attuned to the process that you know how a difference between a natural diamond and a cvd is to be seen so processes like this you know like add more trust to the customer and if such i am and i know that you know there are lot of retail stores in india which follow this practice and then you see the clear difference also and if more and more people adopt this then it will help them in the future mandatory i don't know that you know, like we can put out a notice but who is to follow that cannot be checked but if practices like this this disclosure is you know follow is being followed at the first instance like a very small practice like caratometer like when tanishk was introduced like overnight it branded all the family jewelers as cheaters and that was to be turned around with the advent of caratometer so like you know when there were many jewelers who were selling 916 products back back then also and many years before that also but when caratometer came and when you're showing it to the customer that you know this is at par with whoever you're comparing and instead of being compared you are showing them like disclosing them that you know if i am telling that this is this purity this is there on the screen so you can cross check that makes a world of a difference in the confidence level i think can uh, i can well, i just, just one, add to that yeah one second only yeah. see like you mentioned mandatory or not yes like we had a lot of opposition to hallmarking 
the whole industry was up in arms against it. It became mandatory. Everybody is following it. Let me share some insight into this. Uh, government is thinking on getting certain other disclosures mandatory, making it mandatory that you need to certify or at least at least write on the invoice the clarity. Or I will not go in details on that. Yes, and it is coming. It will come soon. And the job has to, has been given that you have to get it done through an accredited lab. I mean, you cannot go to any round the corner lab and get certified whatever you want. So you have to go to a government approved or government accredited lab to get your things certified. So I think it's good to, 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 for the jewelers to be ready for the future. Understand things now, correct our uh, correct reporting procedures now, and follow them properly. See, um, this when it comes to disclosing what is there inside a product, okay, there are only two methods that happen, okay. One is when the government, there's a law which specifies, a simple thing like an MRP, if you go to many other countries, there is no concept of MRP, but in India there's a concept of MRP for every product, right, which is a good thing for uh, for the country. Um, so what the, what is mandatory and the government tends to decide the most important things which are important uh, from a point of view of the consumer not feeling cheated, okay. So, so those we have to decide what those are. Now beyond those, there are different shaders. Like for example, all of us now buy personal care products and some of them are claimed to be paraben free. I did not know for all this life what is paraben and I did not know that I was using products which, which had paraben all this while, right. So it is a, it is a differentiating strategy. Like uh, some days ago, Godrej came with this refrigerator called and it said our refrigerator has PUF. And you know what PUF is? Polyurethane foam. Every refrigerator had PUF, okay, but they just made it into a strategy saying our refrigerator has PUF. So there are, so what is mandatory will, will come through a law. Uh, what is not mandatory, retailers will use to differentiate it, okay. So I think we should allow the retailers to, for example, somebody says, uh, like treated versus non-treated is an important one, okay. Natural versus lab grown is an important one. Uh, but so I think those basic minimum ones and it will not happen without legislation because without legislation, even if somebody says my my pearls are, for example, natural versus, you know, cultured. I mean, it's not that easy to prove them also. Yeah. If I may come in on this, sir. There is an organization in US called Responsible Jewelry Council. And they take care of the fact that their members, there are thousands of members across US and it is, it is a very tough uh, uh, to get that Responsible Jewelry Council tag. You have to follow certain practices and they check those practices. So those practices are the most ethical trade, trade practices. So this is what is, uh, we, are, we as an industry, we have to grow. And here our growth challenge is coming from two things. One from the uh, big retail chain stores who have their own uh, credibility set because they are big. And two, we have the, 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 the age old fathom of uh, clients belief that uh, either it is your jeweler who is good and rest are cheaters. You see, so we have to get over this. As a whole, as a trade as a whole, we have to get above this. We have to set our own industry, set our own standards, and it has to come from the top. How can it come from the top if, if we are not knowledgeable enough? Coming to the lab-grown aspect, I tell you, when four years ago this thing first crept in, I mean, I as a, a person, I try to keep abreast of technology at the first hand. So you have to attend all those seminars, webinars on whatever. First, keep up, uh, bring up your knowledge to the fore. Then you have to train your staff into that knowledge, convert them it for them, decimate that, that knowledge to them, and then bring that technology on the storefront. So four years ago, we had put a diamond CVD checker on the, on the shop front. And when the clients came up with these questions, I said, look, this is a pittance. I mean, you bring up your own jewelry, go ahead, check in that. That is a simple thing. It is as simple as that. So the question is dispelled. Otherwise, you see, there are discussions and discussions about lab grown going into newspapers, into, into channels, into whatever. I mean, it can be dispelled within five minutes. Just put a simple lab, the diamond CVD screener in, onto your shop front and start, do it. It is as simple as that. It is, it is easy to check, so, so it is not a challenge for us. They're gone. So like that, same way for, for all the treated and untreated gemstones, we have a standard practice in our store. Every tree, everything is mentioned on the, on the tag itself in a, brief, in a, in a brief uh, code, and the staff knows those codes. They are regularly trained. 
to they they would tell you whether the ruby is a glass filled ruby or a natural ruby or a heated ruby to that extent it is on the tag so the staff ha whatever they have to say so for that you have to train your staff so it has to as i said it has to come from the top we have it has to start from us first we have to train ourselves then we have to train our staff and this whole thing has to transform into a customer centric thing thank you I have a story to share. I mean, you've all said a lot of stuff, but I can tell you this, that a, a big jeweler uh, recently told me that he took his mom's jewelry for some evaluation, which was brought from a very big name itself, and they said it was worthless. I mean, not, not much came out of this, and this is a jeweler who knows the jeweler, and I know the jeweler. So, yeah, but I think the times have changed. Now we have hallmarking, so there is pretty a level playing field for single store owners and retail owners as well. And I don't think any of us anymore buys diamonds which are not certified. I think the first thing that you look at in your advice is HUID, you have all the details. People, I have seen people standing in jewelry stores checking HUID, checking it with a, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think there's way more awareness and uh, a lot of uh, things that we, we still are discussing. Uh, I would like to believe that Bombay doesn't have them because I buy most of my jewelry from Bombay, but as I said, North India still has these problems. So we'll perhaps look into it, but much now is on paper. There are these buybacks, there are these uh, uh, discounts, there are these loyalty programs that a lot of single store and retail stores run, which I think do a lot of favor to us. So I think we are pretty off the time as we are, but a final word from all of us. If That's one, one important Just because this was also touched by uh, Nilesh in his presentation. There's also a lot of, lot of talk about giving breakup to a client. Now, where do we stand there? Uh, personally, I feel, yes, breakup is important. You have to give a breakup, but in what format? You have, to, you have to give them the weights. You have to tell them exactly the sizes. But do we have to give a breakup of, of, of the rate? Is that mandatory? Is it should be mandatory or should we do it? Now, I'll carry it further to, to a, again to my experience. I went to a interior designer, I loved the chandelier, which was of course a copy from an Italian brand, and I, I asked the price, and, and she told me an exorbitant price, and I was quite surprised, and like it happened to jewelers, I asked her, can you give me a breakup? You know what she told me? It was an eye opener. Sir, that is your industry, no, not mine. Now why don't we understand that? You have to understand that if other industries are following it, why can't we do it? And it's accepted. <clears throat> the clients accept it from them, so why can't they accept from us? So I think this need to be taken further, and this uh, session is also uh, towards one part is towards that. Uh, if you, all of you can have a uh, last minute uh, uh, thought on that as well, I'll appreciate. It. Thank you. On on this breakup, it's a very jewelry industry thing. Um, Sabesachi once told me, the jeweler, he has nobody asked him for a breakup of his lengas. Okay. But people go to his own jewelry, <laughs> jewelry and ask him for a breakup of his jewelry. So it's just in our mind and you buy more expensive. So if you decide to say no breakup, people will trust you. Yeah, I would like to come here again. Uh, there is a differentiation, sir, and I differ here. A little bit of difference. Why? In India, people are looking at jewelry 80% of the times. It used to be 100% earlier. Then it became 90. Today we are seeing 80% of our clients still looking jewelry as an investment. Okay? As a stridhan, as something that they can give to their daughter for security. No matter if they are buying diamonds, no matter if they are buying gold, no matter if they are buying precious stones also, still they look at that aspect. Atulji, I'll and tell you something. You, yeah. I, s I haven't bought a platinum yet because <laughs> they sell it on MRP. <laughs> so, so and, and now, now I'll compare it with another industry. Just come to it. What else do you buy for an investment? Mutual funds. What has government done? They have to disclose the amount of charges they are going to charge. Okay? Their, their maintenance charges, their, their, their account maintenance charges, their, their hand, handling charges. So, there is nothing wrong with this question in the mind of the client. The, the only question is how you tackle it and how you manage it. If you create and elevate yourselves to a brand value like a like a Tiffany, you can elevate yourself to any other big brand. Yes, you can, I mean, you can ask for any amount. Asabya Saji can ask for any amount XYZ, but still, customers would always ask them, 
because they are buying jewelry. So that is it. You create your own brand value and then you ask for a, for a handsome markup, no problem. The customer would pay you the nuisance value of wearing you, your name. Otherwise, you will keep selling, comparing yourself to the jeweler on your side and jeweler on your left and comparing those same labor charges and values. So the answer lies in creating a brand value, an aspirational value for your brand. Thank you. I think with that, we'll call it uh, time for lunch. <laughs> well, uh, before we proceed for the lunch break, I would like to request Sri Soma Sundram, PR Regional Manager, CEO India World Gold Council, and Sabbisachi Rai, Executive Director, GJEPC, to please join me on stage to present the memento to the presenters of this session. Thank you so much, sir. I would like you to quickly present the memento to all our panelists. Uh, it was a great session on independent store and organized retail, a sustainable coexistence. We had a great time talking to you. Uh, we could not take the questions of the audience. We would appreciate uh, if uh, you want to ask anything, we can ask those questions along with the any queries that you have uh, in the next session. For as of now, we are heading for the lunch break and sharp at 2.45, we begin our next session, which is on raising compliance through respons responsible sourcing globally. So see you all at 2.45. Thank you so much to all our uh, panelists and the moderators. Thank you so very much once again. You may all can proceed for the lunch now. Lunch and then we have this raising compliance. Yeah. For this Oh, yeah. This is the true meaning uh, of she's the beginning of jewelry and hip hop music. Gold rope chains were the jewelry. Well, once again, we are getting back here by 2:45. We have one of the very important speakers connecting us online. So I request all of you to quickly rush for the lunch break and be back by 2:45. Thank you so much, and see you all.